My name is Mark Katz, and I'm the Vice President of the Great Neck Historical Society. And on behalf of our Board of Directors, I'd like to welcome you all and thank you for joining us this evening. The Great Neck Historical Society is a group of people, volunteers in our community, who get together on a regular basis to work to preserve Great Neck's past and also to present programs such as this one about the history of Great Neck so that uh, the community is aware of our historic past. Uh, we have worked quite a bit to uh, preserve elements of the Playhouse Theater, the Stepping Stones Lighthouse, the Saddle Rock Grist Mill, and to present uh, stories about these structures and others to the community. We'd like to invite you to join us, and uh, dues are very nominal, but more important, you get to work on learning about the community and uh, meet a good group of people who uh, have a great deal of concern about Great Neck. <coughs> as far as tonight's program goes, uh, everyone knows that Great Neck is a predominantly Jewish community, but what people don't realize is that the Jews of Great Neck and the Jews throughout Long Island have had a major role in the development of the Long Island area. And I'd like to introduce to you the Vice President of Programs for the Historical Society, Carol Frank, who will tell us more about tonight's program. Carol. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark, and it's so good to see all of you here tonight. We're really excited about this program. Um, I want to, before I begin and introduce our speaker, I especially want to thank the staff of Great Neck House, uh, the Park District allowing us to use this facility uh, for our programs. It's a wonderful uh, asset to the community and historic in its own right. Uh, I also want to make a special uh, thank you to North Shore TV. We have Jean with us tonight who's going to be uh, doing the, the camera work. And it is wonderful to be able to know that people who were not able to come tonight will be able to see this program because it will, it will be recorded, it will be on public access. It will be on our website, and it will be on YouTube. So you'll be able to, if you want to refresh your memory uh, about what you've learned tonight, uh, you'll be able to go back and see this later. I want to let you know that after the presentation, we always have a question and answer session, and that is always very interesting. We learn a lot there, too. And some of our speakers even learn some more about the community that they didn't know. Um, so we are very, very honored to have Brad Kolodny as, as our speaker tonight. He is uh, the president of the Jewish Historical Society of Long Island. He has written, and I know that all of you are aware of this because that was part of the publicity, that he has written two very outstanding books about the history of Jews on Long Island, first with a book about the synagogues of Long Island that was published in 2019, and most recently his latest book about the history of Jews on Long Island. And I was talking with him before uh, we started. He has been working on this last book for two years, and we can thank COVID for that, uh, because he had some time on his hands at home. And uh, I can really appreciate so much uh, what it would be like to do the kind of research that he had to do. And I know with research, you go down a lot of blind alleys and you get stuck, and uh, you have a lucky moment when you discover something. So. We are very honored and very happy to have him with us tonight, and here's Brad. Thank you, Carol, and thank you, Mark, and appreciate uh, all of you coming out this evening. Um, happy to present my book, The Jews of Long Island, 1705 to 1918. Um, 
You know, there's a little bit of a myth here on Long Island, and most people seem to think or believe that Jews only came to Long Island after World War II. And while the population of Long Island grew significantly after World War II, there were many Jews who lived on Long Island before that. But it's just something that has not been discussed or taught or researched, and that was my mission. Um, as Carol mentioned, I did write a book that came out in 2019. It's called Seeking Sanctuary, 125 Years of Synagogues on Long Island. This was a project that took me four years to complete. Um, I started in 2015, and I uh, set out to document every single synagogue that has ever existed in Nassau and Suffolk counties, past and present. And so the book is a a fully comprehensive volume that has information about every single synagogue. Um, when this book came out in 2019, I started doing speaking engagements much like tonight, and that lasted up until March of 2020. And as Carol mentioned, um, when COVID hit, I decided to take on a new project. And instead of a completely comprehensive volume about the synagogues, I set out to write a fully comprehensive book about the Jews of Long Island. And a lot of people ask me, well, why did you stop at 1918? Um, the fact is that, you know, there were thousands of Jews who lived on Long Island before 1918, over 4,000. And I wanted to write a book that was comprehensive about all of them. And so in the book, of all these people that I found, all of their names are in the book. So you have 16 chapters, and they are uh, chapters that are uh, done by town. So you have a chapter for Freeport, and Glen Cove, and Patchogue, and Huntington. And there's also a chapter of the North Shore, the Gold Coast, and that's where Great Neck fits in. There wasn't enough information about Jews living in Great Neck before 1918 to warrant its own chapter, but there is information about the early Jews who lived in Great Neck, um, including the very first Jew to come to Great Neck in the 1890s. His name was Abram Wolf. Yeah. Is that your relative? And mine. I was t and your? Wait, we got three? Yeah. Your relative. Four? Your relative. We're Anybody else? We're descendants. Well, we're going to have to speak about Abram Wolf after the presentation because that is really, really exciting for me. Wow. Great, great? Great, great. Great grandfather. Yeah. Okay, wow, that's amazing. Um, well, maybe very quickly, I'll just say that Abram Wolf came to Great Neck in 1890 because he was a tailor for um, Mr. Grace, who was the mayor of New York City. And Grace had a, an estate out here in Great Neck, hence Grace Plaza, right? And he said to his friend, the tailor, why don't you come out to Great Neck? There's no tailor there. And that's how Abram Wolf became the first Jew to live in Great Neck. Now, my, the presentation tonight really is not about Great Neck. It's about all of Long Island. And when I talk about Long Island, I'm only referring to Nassau and Suffolk counties. Okay? Brooklyn and Queens, we can debate all night whether they're part of Long Island or not. <laughs> they're obviously part of New York City. And I think colloquially, Long Island means Nassau and Suffolk, and that's what it means to me. So let me take you through the book and some details about the Jews of Long Island up until the end of World War I. And we may as well cover it uh, chronologically. So to start with the very first Jew to live on Long Island, his name was Nathan Simpson, and he moved to Long Island in 1705. He was a shopkeeper in Brookhaven. He, he was born in London, he was a merchant, and came to, it preceded being the United States, he came to North America and lived in Manhattan. 1705, he moved out to Brookhaven. By 1720, he was back in New York City, and we know this because he was the president of Sha'irith Israel, the Spanish and Portuguese congregation in New York City, which is the oldest congregation in North America. Nathan Simpson had a nephew and his nephew's name was Joseph Simpson. Joseph Simpson was also a merchant. 
Uh, he was also from London, and he came to the United States, lived in New York City, in, in Manhattan. Um, and in 1726, Joseph Simpson and his wife purchased land in Oyster Bay, and they would spend the summers in Oyster Bay in the 1720s, sort of the very first of the you know Long Island summer residents, as we have many now out east. Um, Joseph Simpson and his wife Rebecca had a son named Solomon Simpson, and at the time of the Revolutionary War, Solomon Simpson owned two homes in Oyster Bay, but he was a patriot. He was loyal to the American cause, and because of that, he left Long Island to be amongst fighting patriots in Connecticut. Long Island was occupied by the British, and Solomon Simpson did not want to live under British rule, so he moved to Connecticut. There is another individual uh, who lived on Long Island during the Revolutionary War. You have a question? Did Joseph Simpson actually live 101 years? He did. He did. He died in, in no, what's the date? Well, he did. 101. 101. And this picture, this picture was painted of him when he was 100 by the same artist. By the same artist who, who painted George Washington, he was the first artist, his name was John Ramage, a French artist, and he was the first artist to paint George Washington when he became president of the United States. I'm sorry. Was he significant, a significant merchant, to be painted by the same Well, I think that from what I've read, the artist was intrigued by the uh, physical, uh, the way this man looked, and to have somebody who was a hundred years old in 1786 or seven would have been quite unique. So the other uh, Jewish individual who lived on Long Island during the Revolutionary War, his name was Aaron Isaacs. Aaron Isaacs was a Jew uh, Jewish German immigrant who came to America in 1749. By 1751, he was living in Maidstone. Does anybody know where Maidstone is? East Hampton. Very good. East Hampton. Right. Yes. There's the Maidstone Inn. Well, the Maidstone Inn, there's, yeah. So Maidstone was originally called, what is now called East Hampton. And Aaron Isaacs is buried uh, on the, in the Village Green on the cemetery there, right on Main Street. Now, there are no reliable statistics until you get to the 1930s about the Jewish population on Long Island. And so what I've done through my research is to come up with um, at least locations where I know Jews were living at certain periods before 1930. So in 1776, or by 1776, we know that there were Jews living in six different communities from east to west, and, or whichever direction. And we also, uh, we, we can assume that it was probably no more than 50 people. 50 Jews living on Long Island at the time of the Revolutionary War. There are reliable statistics about the Jewish population of the United States going back to early days. In 1790, there were 1,500 Jews. In 1820, there were 3,000. There is one person that I found that were not a lot of Jews who came to the United States during this period, the 1820s. There is one person that I found who did, and he lived in Sag Harbor. His name was Joshua Montefiore. And if the name Montefiore sounds familiar, he is the uncle of Sir Moses Montefiore, who was a financier and a philanthropist from London. Now, Joshua Montefiore's wife, her name was Isabella. Joshua Montefiore was a notary public and a conveyancer. A conveyancer is somebody who had the legal authority to conduct land transactions. And so he lived in Sag, in Sag Harbor in 1824. He placed this advertisement in the Sag Harbor newspaper. His wife also placed an advertisement. She was a bit of a Renaissance woman working in 1824. She was a hat maker and a dressmaker. And she would go with her husband into New York City to bring back the latest fashions for the women of Sag Harbor. The Jewish population, even in 1840, not particularly significant in the United States, but that certainly changes beginning in 1840 with the influx of German immigration to the United States. Um, there are 
Germans who came to America, there were German Jews who came to America, and German Jews who made their way out to Long Island. One of them, his name is Andrew Fischel. Now what you're looking at here is the 1860 census for the village of Patchogue. And in this record, you see that Andrew Fischel was 31 years old. He was a merchant, and he was from Germany. And what's the most significant piece of information? The value of his estate, $5,000. In 1860, that's a, that's a big sum. That's a big amount of money. Andrew Fischel was a merchant. He owned a store at the intersection of Montauk Highway and Ocean Avenue in Patchogue. So right in the heart of town. Interesting story about Andrew Fischel. He, in 1893, he decided to sell his business. He sold the, the building and the contents of the store. He sold it to one of his clerks, and the clerk's name was Arthur Sweezy. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the yeah. Sweezy stores, but Sweezy's started in, Beth, in, in uh, Patchogue, and it was at this location that was Andrew Fischel's store to begin with. Now, Andrew Fischel had a brother who also came to Long Island. His name was Jonas Fischel. Jonas lived in Riverhead, and he had a store in Riverhead beginning in 1856. Andrew and Jonas had a cousin whose name was Ephraim Fischel, and what you're looking at here is the last will and testament of Ephraim Fischel, who passed away in 1866. He was married to a woman named Therese, and they had four children. And when Ephraim passed away, Therese married yet another Fischel, whose name was Leopold Fischel. Leopold was a brother of Jonas and Andrew. So Leopold lived in Babylon, so between these three brothers, they had a, a pretty good uh, business going in terms of uh, uh, retail operation in Suffolk County. So this slide is representative not only of the uh, German-Jewish immigration experience on Long Island, it's also representative of the resources that I used to write the book. And uh, I acquired information utilizing census records, anything that can be looked up online, uh, death certificates, marriage licenses, uh, World War I registration records, as well as newspapers. And newspapers were an incredible resource. There is a website that um, has old newspapers in New York State that are fully searchable online. And uh, one such example of an article that I found by doing searches on this newspaper website is this article about the formation of the Sayville Fire Department in 1878. Now, there aren't too many Jews in Sayville today, I can't imagine how many Jews were in Sayville in 1878, but we know that there was at least two because they were both founders of the Sayville Volunteer Fire Department. The first one, his name was Francis Gerber. Francis Gerber was a German Jewish immigrant who was living in Sayville by 1870, and he opened up this store, bearing his last name, Gerber's. In 1871, it was opened for 50 years until he passed away in 1921. The other person mentioned in this article, his name is Moses Da Silva. The name Da Silva, a little bit different than German or Eastern European Jewish immigrants. Moses Da Silva was a, uh, from the Sephardic background. Uh, he himself was actually from Amsterdam, and in Amsterdam, his occupation was as a cigar manufacturer. And he continued to do that when he came to the United States. In addition to being a cigar manufacturer, he ended up getting into the retail business with his son. This is an advertisement for M. De Silva and Son, the store located in Hewlett's. Hewlett's with an S on the end, which we don't recognize today, but it is certainly the area of Hewlett, Hewlett Harbor, Hewlett Park, that, that whole area. Moses De Silva had in addition to his son Isaac, had a daughter named Rebecca, and Rebecca was married to a man named Henry Gobetz. Henry Gobetz, as you can see from this advertisement, was in the cigar and tobacco business. Where do you think he got his inventory from? 
his father-in-law. Henry Gobetz's store was located in Freeport. And due to the success of the store, the entire uh, De Silva family decided to move and lived in Freeport. Isaac decided to open up his own store. This is a photograph of the store. It no longer exists. It was located on the north side of Merrick Road in Freeport, just east of South Main Street. But Isaac, being of the next generation, he was not content with just owning one store. He opened up a second store in Freeport. This building actually does still exist. It's at the corner of Sunrise Highway and South Main Street. It's a little bit of a unique building that has this curvature and it does still stand. And Isaac wasn't even done there. The De Silva five and 10 cent store chain had locations in eight or seven different towns all on Long Island. It was basically the first chain store of its kind and it was owned by a Jewish family. Now before any of, uh, before this all occurred, everything that I've mentioned so far really occurred before any Jewish community could be established on Long Island. You had a handful of Jews here, a handful of Jews there. The very first congregation established on Long Island was in the town of Breslau. And it was called Netta Sarche. That was the name of the congregation. It was established in 1875. They never built a synagogue, but they did purchase land in the Breslau Cemetery set aside separately for Jewish burials. Because the cemetery was consecrated in 1876, it is almost 150 years old, and it is the oldest remnant of Jewish communal life on Long Island. Now, I mentioned that, that this congregation was formed in Breslau. Anybody know where Breslau is? No. You never heard of Breslau. No, Germany. It was in Germany, correct? That's because the town of Breslau on Long Island was a, uh, a hamlet that was established by German immigrants in 1871. It was on the southwestern part of Suffolk County. And in 1891, the name of Breslau was changed to Lindenhurst. Uh -huh. So Lindenhurst is the location of the very first congregation ever established on Long Island. So let's take another look at the Jewish population. You can see from 1840 to 1880, the, the Jewish population in the United States is growing significantly because of German immigration. But what was to come would be an even larger um, group of immigrants from Eastern Europe. Between 1880 and 1920, you had over 2 million Jews who came to the United States. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. We're still at 1880. And in 1880, you had Jews living in 16 different communities in the United, uh, on Long Island, in Nassau and Suffolk. And there's a trend here. These, all these communities were located near the water. And, and this, was not a, this was not a Jewish thing. This was uh, just a trend of people who came out to Long Island would live near the water. And that's where villages were established because of the ease of moving goods and people using waterways. So when Jews were coming out to Long Island, they were settling where the population existed. And there were three main occupations that Jews took up during this period. They were merchants. We've talked a lot about that already, but we'll talk a little bit more about merchants. There were also Jewish farmers, and there were Jewish factory workers. So let me tell you about each one of these. First, about uh, merchants. Not everybody like uh, Andrew Fischel was wealthy and came to America with money. Um, people were new immigrants and they were starting out with nothing. And when you start out with nothing, you can only sell what you can carry. So let me read from you, read for you from this article if you can't see it. Uh, this is the story about Max Smith, and it comes out of the Seaside Times newspaper from 1908, talking about Max Smith, who, who moved to Southampton in 1873. 
The article says, Smith set out with a small stock of goods, which he sold through the East End villages from a basket carried on his arm. Think about it. He has no way to support himself other than selling things that he can carry. So he's probably selling things that are not very heavy, right? Maybe needles and thread, maybe some light clothing. But he has success, and the article continues saying, after a few years, his stock of goods gradually increased until he was unable to carry it on foot, and he bought a horse and wagon, which enabled him to carry a much larger business, much larger stock, and do a much larger business. So with a horse and wagon, he can now start selling maybe some larger, heavier household goods, maybe pots and pans, for instance. Um, and also with a horse and wagon, he can now cover a larger territory. So he's not limited to just the area that he can get to on foot. And lastly, um, in 1888, he established himself in Southampton in the central business section of Main Street. So Max Smith opens up a store in 1888, and what happens now is that people can come to him in, in, instead of him going out and finding customers and selling that way. Now, there's another immigrant who had a similar story. His name is Sam Clark. And by the way, I probably should have mentioned Max Smith, not his real name, yeah. right? He came to the United States. He wanted to be a Yankee, so he took the name Max Smith. I don't know what his uh, birth name was, but for Sam Clark, I do know his birth name. His name was Shmuel Likich. <laughs> and if your name was Shmuel Likich and you wanted to make it in America, you might decide to take the name Sam Clark. Well, Sam Clark came to the United States, lived in Elwood, and he started out as a peddler in the North, Northport, Smithtown, Asherokan area. He graduated to the horse and wagon and ended up opening up this store in Central Islip. And you can see Sam right here with his wife and their son and a customer. Um, not every story was, you know, not every success, not everyone had such easy success. And Sam Clark, at one point, his store in Central Islip went bankrupt. So it wasn't easy for him, but he was fortunate to have a wealthy relative who was able to buy him out of bankruptcy and put him back in business, so the story does have a happy ending. One more uh, merchant that's worth mentioning, you know, Max Smith, Sam Clark, they were both out in Suffolk County. There were obviously merchants who also did business in Nassau County, one of them being Harry Jacobs. And Harry Jacobs came to the United States in 1890. He came into Castle Gardens, which is the uh, the uh, Center for Processing Immigrants, even before Ellis Island opened up. So Harry Jacobs came in 1890, and he started out as a peddler, but his experience was a little bit different. He uh, lived in New York City, and he would take a ferry from New York City to Sands Point on a daily basis, and then when he got to Sands Point, he would take a stagecoach into town, into Port Washington. And what did Harry Jacobs sell? Remember, he's a peddler. He can only sell what he can carry. Harry Jacobs sold matches. <laughs> could you imagine that somebody could make a living selling matches? After time, he graduated to the horse and wagon. He went into business with his brother. They opened up a store in Port Washington, all starting from selling matches. My wife tells me that at this point in the presentation, I should throw in a little joke that he was the first matchmaker on Long Island. <laughs> um, other than peddlers and, and merchants, there were also uh, factory workers that came out to Long Island during the late 19th century. Uh, this is the J.W. Elberson rubber factory that existed in Setauket starting in 1880. Um, the factory needed both skilled and manual labor positions filled. And so the owner of the factory would go to Ellis Island and bring not only Jewish immigrants, but Irish immigrants and Italian immigrants to come to the factory. They offered them not only a steady salary, but company housing to bring your family 
So think about it. If you're an immigrant and you're coming off the boat, you, ha you have no job, you have nowhere to live, you probably don't speak the language, and somebody offers you this opportunity, you're going to run, not just walk, to get out to this rubber factory in Setauket, and who at that time would have even known where Setauket was. But they went, and they established a Jewish community. There were enough Jews living in Setauket in 1893 to establish a community that was called Agudas Achim, and three years later, the congregation constructed this building, which still stands today. It is the first building ever constructed for use as a synagogue on Long Island. It opened in Setauket in 1896. Um, the quick story about what happened to this congregation. Um, in 1904, the rubber factory burned down. And so people had to leave town after less than 10 years of the synagogue being open. Uh, people are leaving to talk it. By 1918, the congregation is completely defunct. 30 years later, in the post-World War II era, you have uh, families that are, uh, Jewish families that are moving to the Setauket area, and a new congregation is established in this building, and they call themselves North Shore Jewish Center. <laughs> Maybe you've heard of North Shore Jewish Center. It still exists today. In 1971, they built their own building in Port Jeff Station, just about three miles away from where this building is. They sold the building to the Setauket United Methodist Church, which is right next door, and they named the building Shalom Hall, which I thought was a nice, nice little touch there. Other immigrants and other Jews came out to Long Island to work in a factory in Sag Harbor, the Fays Watch Case Factory. That opened in 1881, and there were enough Jews living in Sag Harbor in 1883 to establish the Jewish Association of United Brethren. This was more of a social organization, but they did hold services on the high holidays. Uh, they built this synagogue that opened in 1900, and this congregation still exists today. It is called Temple Adas Israel. And Temple Adas Israel has the distinction of being the oldest continuously used synagogue building because they still use the same building from 1900. So it's still going 123 years later. And one other community on Long Island uh, based around a factory, the American Lace and Manufacturing Company in Patchogue, they established the Hebrew Society in 1900, and they opened up this building in 1904. The congregation also still exists today. It's called Temple Bethel, and they, this particular building was knocked down, and they built a new structure in its place in 1931. And there are farmers that came out to Long Island, mostly Suffolk County, probably because the land was cheaper, the first one that I like to mention is Jacob Carlin, who started the Triangle Farm in Calverton in 1913. He, drew, he grew traditional crops, corn, wheat, fruits, and vegetables. And the Carlin Farm existed up until the 1980s. Uh, Jacob Carlin's grandchildren worked on the farm, and it wasn't until the 1980s when they sold the property to a real estate developer. And what you can see is the names of the streets, Jake's Lane and Carlin Drive, named for Jacob Carlin. There was also a dairy farm that existed on Long Island in Elwood starting in 1910, the Oak Tree Farm Dairy. Um, I don't know if any of you know the Elwood area, but if you go north from Jericho Turnpike on Elwood Road, on the left-hand side there is a 55 and over community called The Seasons. That's where the Oak Tree Farm Dairy was located. And there's another farm that started in 1909. Long Island is known for duck. There was a Jewish duck farmer who came to Long Island, started the Bernstein Duck Farm. It was started by Harry Bernstein. The picture here is of Harry's son, Abe Bernstein, standing beneath the sign that bears the family name, Bernstein Boulevard, which is the location where the duck farm was found. And there's one more farm that I want to tell you about. It was not known for producing crops or raising animals. 
The Indian head farm in Comac and Kings Park was strictly there to teach young Jewish men how to become a farmer. It was 500 acres that were owned by the Baron de Hirsch Foundation. If you wanted to be a farmer, you could apply, you could go and live at the farm, and if you completed a one-year course on how to be a farmer, you were then eligible for subsidized loans to go purchase land elsewhere, and many did this in um, places like Lakewood, New Jersey, and Connecticut. Now, I mentioned uh, the first synagogue built on Long Island. Well, the first congregation, Lindenhurst, right? The first synagogue built was in Setauket. Anybody want to take a guess in what community in Nassau County was the first synagogue built? What an excellent guess. <laughs> but it's not correct. I'm sorry to tell you. Temple... Glen Cove, right off the bat. You read the book already? I heard you speak. <laughs> oh, you're, <laughs> you're cheating, you're cheating. That's true. The very first congregation established in Nassau County was in Glen Cove. It was called, and still is called, Congregation Tefereth Israel. It was started by Isaac Bessel. And even before the congregation was started, Isaac and Esther Bessel would host services in their home for the sole reason, because they owned a Torah. So people would come to them for services. The picture uh, in the background is of an opera house, which is where um, the congregation held services. That synagogue, or that, I should say, opera house, was torn down in 1925, and they built a new synagogue in its place. And if you go to Congregation to Ferreth Israel today, they still read from the Bessel Torah over 125 years later. Now, this congregation only built a synagogue in the 1920s. The oldest synagogue built in Nassau County was built in 1915 in what town? Hold off, ma'am, you know the answer, I'm sure. In what town in Nassau County was the first synagogue built? Roslyn. Roslyn, that's a pretty good guess. Not correct. <laughs> Great Neck. Well, Temple Bethel was the first synagogue in Great Neck, and that opened in 1932. So there were a few synagogues that were built before that. This one in particular, 1915. Not Garden City. Not Garden City, that is correct. And not Manhasset. Or what? The center of the Diocese of Long Island <laughs> is the location where the first synagogue wow. was built oh, on Long Island. Oh, oh, Rockville Center, indeed. It, it was called B'nai Shalom today. The congregation still exists. It's called B'nai Shalom Great. Beth David. And it was built in 1915. Uh, a pretty unique feature of this synagogue, as you can see from this painting. Right next to the synagogue, there was a trolley tracks and a trolley would run right by the synagogue. It, it, it started in Jamaica and went all the way to Freeport. And you have to wonder if the congregation selected that location because it would make it easier for people to get there. Let's take one more look at the Jewish population in the United States. You can see the tremendous jump from 1880 to 1917 due to Eastern European Jews coming to the United States. And what does this look like on Long Island in 1918? You have Jews living in 75 different communities, all before the end of World War I. Now, the trend earlier on the map was that villages were established along the water, and that still is the case because, you know, in 1918, the LIE in the northern state and the southern state are still decades away from being built. But the trend here is all of these communities cropping up in western Nassau County. Now, how do we explain that? Well, before 1910, if you wanted to get into New York City using mass transit, you would take the Long Island Railroad to Long Island City. You would get off the train, you would board a ferry, the ferry would take you across the East River to the East 34th Street Terminal, and you would end up finally in Manhattan. In 1910, the East River Tunnel opened, 
And so it was much easier for people to get to Midtown Manhattan, going directly into Penn Station, and you had the beginning of the commuter generation. You had people living in Great Neck now, going to New York City on a daily basis. You had people from the five towns, people working in the garment center and in the jewelry district and people on Wall Street. There's one person in particular that I want to bring to your attention. And his name was Samuel Bernstein. Samuel Bernstein was the foreman of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. Now, many of you may know and be familiar with the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. In 1911, there was a fire that killed 146 people, mostly young Jewish and young Italian women who were working in the factory and couldn't get out when a fire broke out on the 9th and 10th floors of the factory. Samuel Bernstein was the foreman of the factory, and from all accounts, after the fire, he tried to put the fire out, and he also led many people to safety through an elevator, onto the roof, and through a staircase. One of the staircases was locked, and one of the staircases was open. Samuel Bernstein was seen as somebody who did everything that he could to save lives, and he himself survived that day. But after that, that episode, he decided to leave New York City, and he went to live in Lawrence. And you can see, this is actually a copy, or taken out of the book, from the chapter of Cedarhurst. You can see residents of Lawrence, Samuel Bernstein and his family, moved out to Lawrence. He continued to work in the shirtwaist business, and he opened up his own uh, location on Broadway, and he himself continued to go from New York City back home to Lawrence on a daily basis. <clears throat> and as I mentioned, this table comes out of the book in each chapter. At the end of each chapter, I listed the names of every single person that I found with a little bit of information. Um, maybe what their occupation was or if they belonged to a synagogue. It's interesting that Samuel Bernstein, a Long Island Jew, was at the intersection of a major moment in this country's history because of the union laws and, and uh, workers' rights that came out of seeing this fire happen. There were other well-known personalities and celebrities who lived on Long Island before the end of World War I, and one of them is this woman. Her name is Eva Puck. I'm gonna guess that nobody has ever heard of her. Um, Eva Puck was a star on the vaudeville circuit. Uh, she was a, a child actress and ended up uh, being a Broadway star. She was in the original cast of Showboat in 1927, and she grew up in Freeport. When the synagogue in Freeport was being built in, in the 1920s, she would actually host a fundraiser where she would perform and raise money for the synagogue. Some of you might remember this guy, Jack Barry, absolutely. He was a game show host, and he makes it into the book because he was born in 1918 in Lindenhurst, but his name was Jack Barish. He changed his name to Jack Barry because he was on the radio and he became you know, involved in, in television. So Jack Barry, also from Long Island. And the most interesting person that I found is this man. His name is Leo Fischel. We spoke about the Fischels earlier, yes. Leopold Fischel, this is his youngest son, Leo Fischel, and you can see that he was a baseball player. Leo Fischel, um, in 1899, was a student at Columbia. He was studying law, and he was the star pitcher of Columbia's baseball team. Well, the New York Giants needed a pitcher one day and on May 3rd, 1899, the New York Giants took Leo Fischel from the Columbia team. He pitched a game for the New York Giants. The Giants ended up losing, but he pitched a good game and everybody felt that Leo Fischel would be signed. There were stories in the newspaper about it in the New York Times and elsewhere that after he graduated from college in June, Leo would be signed to a contract. Well, it never happened. Um, but Leo Fischel does have the distinction of being the first Jewish pitcher in the history of Major League Baseball. 
So don't let anybody tell you that Sandy Koufax was the first. Leo Fischel, born in Babylon in 1877, the first Jewish pitcher in the history of Major League Baseball. And the end of the story here is, well, why didn't he you know, become a baseball player? He certainly was courted by a number of teams. But instead of becoming a baseball player, he decided to become a lawyer, perhaps even encouraged by his parents, for sure. No doubt about it. Anybody recognize this, this guy? Not Eddie Cantor. Irving Berlin, yes. Irving Berlin, in 1918, was already an established celebrity. He was a composer and, and, and wrote Broadway shows. And in 1918, he is enlisted in the army, and he served at Camp Upton in Yampank, here on Long Island in Suffolk County. So what does the army do with somebody who has this talent? They actually put him to work to create a show. And the show was to raise money for the army base at Camp Upton. The name of the show? Do you know it? Anybody know the name of the show that Irving Berlin wrote? The name of the show was called Yip Yip Yap Hank. <laughs> This was a light-hearted, uh, comedic show that was really just a musical review. There was, no, there was no theme or plot or anything like that. But the, the most interesting part of Yip Yip Yap Hank is that when Irving Berlin went to write the finale, he wrote a song called God Bless America. And instead of using it in the show, it was such a patriotic song, it still is, but because Yip Yip Yap Hank was such a lighthearted, comical type thing, the finale didn't fit. So he put the song away in his footlocker, and 20 years later, in the lead up to World War II, he gives the song to Kate Smith, she performs it on her radio show, and as they say, the rest is history. But it's so interesting to think that a, Jer a Jewish immigrant living on Long Island wrote the most patriotic song in our nation's history. Before I wrote the book, I, I really didn't know a lot about uh, World War I, and I learned a lot by basically just going to towns and villages that had a sizable population in 1918. They sent a lot of young boys to war, and these men are memorialized in monuments that exist in places like Amagansett, and Huntington, and Patchog, and uh, all these different villages. Um, the, the photo on the left is, is in Greenport, and it's one of my favorite statues uh, memorializing World War I. It has the names, you can't see it here, but it has the names of all the soldiers who fought, and there were Jewish soldiers from Greenport who fought in World War I. There were three men I found in my research who were Jewish from Long Island and lost their lives during World War I on the battlefields in France. And they are Isaac Solomonoff from Huntington, Harry Golden from Setauket, and Isaac Tisnauer from Southampton. All of these men are remembered and memorialized today through these monuments that exist in the villages where they live. There are also uh, things that we can remember before 1918 by seeing them today. There are several synagogues, well I wouldn't say several, four synagogues, or buildings that still stand today that were once used as a synagogue before 1918. You have the Setauket Synagogue from 1896, and uh, I don't mind mentioning that this historic marker was erected by the Jewish Historical Society of Long Island an organization that I founded and I'm president of, we put up this historic marker in 2021, which was on the 125th anniversary of the building's opening. This building on the right is the Sag Harbor Synagogue. They're undergoing a, a construction project. The congregation is actually growing. On the lower left, you have the uh, Congregation Tefereth Israel in Greenport. That opened in 1903, and if you go there today, it is 
very much the same as it was 120 years ago. And lastly, this building here, this is the original home of the Huntington Jewish Center. This synagogue opened in 1913, but as you can perhaps tell, these, uh, the building has been subdivided into apartments and it is now living quarters. Um, it exists, uh, it still stands. Uh, it's actually located in Huntington Station. So it's just north of the train tracks in Huntington. If you ever wanted to go see it, um, you can find it on a street that you would assume is where a synagogue is located. It's located on Church Street. <laughs> so pretty easy to find. And there are a number of Jewish-owned businesses that existed on Long Island before 1918 that are still in business today. You have the law firm of David Au and David Au that started in Patchogue in 1913 by Harry David Au, now run by his grandson, Lawrence David Au. And not too far from here, I don't know if anybody's ever purchased carpet at Harry Katz in Mineola. Harry Katz Carpet One started in 1932. I mention it because it actually started with Joseph Katz, who opened the North Shore Furniture Company in 1916. <laughs> Joseph Katz's business went out during the Depression, and Harry Katz took the remnants from the store, started his own business that is still going 90 years later and run by Harry Katz's grandchildren. Uh, Gary and uh, Deborah, I think her name is. And the oldest Jewish-owned business on Long Island is Leader's Jewelry Store in Rockville Center. <coughs> Leader's opened in 1903. For a while it was a, uh, a, a bazaar of sold household goods and, and, and little knickknacks. In 1948 it became a jewelry store and today you have Lloyd and his son Benjamin Leader running the store. Benjamin is the fifth generation Leader family member to run the store. And the last Jewish owned business I want to share with you, it's a little bit more personal to me. Um, this is the Amityville men's shop that opened in 1911. This is Louis Cohen who opened up the shop. And this is a friend of mine. This is Brad Cohen who is Louis Cohen's grandson. Brad Cohen is a member of my synagogue, and when I was doing research for the books, he would tell me stories about Amityville growing up, that his father and grandfather lived there, about the Jewish community and whatnot. Um, the store is still run today by Brad's brother, Warren, and Warren's daughter, Alexa, uh, 112 years later. Now, there's a... Uh, you know, in doing my research, I had met with a lot of different people, including uh, town historians and historical societies. And I met one day with the historian for the town of Babylon. And she said to me, you know, we have this picture in our collection. This is what the picture looks like. We have this picture in our collection. We know it's a Jewish wedding, but we don't know when it's from, and we don't know who's in the photo. So she challenged me and said, hey, maybe you can find out something about these people. So I took the challenge and I, my first step was to go to my friend Brad because Brad is from Amityville, his parents and grandparents were there. Um, and this photograph coming from the historian for the town of Babylon, Babylon is very close to Amityville. So I say to Brad, have you ever seen this picture? And he says to me, I have not seen this picture. However, my grandfather is in this photo. <laughs> Lewis Cohen came to the United States in 1911. That's my first clue. The photo is from 1911 or later. And then Brad looks at it again. He says, I don't believe it. My great-grandfather wow. is in this picture. Lewis Cohen made enough money to support his family and also send for his parents, who were still living in Europe, came to the United States in 1914. So now I know that the photo is from 1914 or later. So then I start to think, well, maybe I can find a wedding announcement in the newspaper. I utilized newspaper archives, and the South Side Signal is an old newspaper that is online and available, and uh, I decided to look in the South Side Signal to see if there was a wedding announcement 
that might be from around 1914. And there was. There was a wedding announcement in the paper for a couple named Solomon Weingrad and Ruth Esther Siegel. There were many wedding announcements, but this was the only one that had sort of Jewish sounding names, right? So now I read through the article and I, it's a great article, it tells about who came to the wedding and who officiated and all that, but I can't find a direct link between the article and the photograph. There's nothing that uh, you know, provides that for me. So I go back to the historian in Babylon and I say, here's what I know. Are you familiar with anyone named Solomon Weingrad or Ruth Esther Siegel? And she says, I've never heard of these people. However, you might want to talk to my friend Aaron Stein, because Aaron Stein has a business on Main Street in Babylon, and the name of the business is called Norton and Siegel. This has got to be it, right? So I go to the store, I meet Aaron Stein, who's on the right, and Aaron says, of course I've seen this picture. There's my grandfather. <laughs> Sidney Siegel is poking his head between the bride and the groom. He must have felt comfortable enough to stand there because his sister is the bride, Ruth Esther Siegel. And I was able to determine that this photograph was taken on May 19th, 1916. And I love the story so much, I used it on the cover of the book. Oh. Thank you. So, uh, before I take questions, I will mention that I have copies of the book available this evening, if anybody's interested in purchasing a copy. It sells, uh, the cover price is $33, I'm happy to sell it for $30 tonight and I'm happy to take cash or check or Venmo or credit card or PayPal or anything else that you have. Um, questions? Yes, sir. They were. Um, the Jews that came from Europe were starting synagogues in the tradition that they knew, which was Orthodox Judaism. Um, the Reform Movement didn't really come along until the 19-teens and 20s in the United States. Temple Bethel of Great Neck being, you know, a pioneer there here on the North Shore. Uh, there was a synagogue, or still is, a synagogue in Lawrence. Temple Israel in Lawrence is a Reform congregation that actually started in Far Rockaway and moved across the border into Lawrence in 1930. So, yeah, in fact, synagogues in Setauket and in Greenport, if you go there, you will see that they still have a balcony for seating for the women, because there was separate seating for Orthodox congregations. Other questions? Yes. The congregations that came then had to bring rabbi or somebody. Where would they find mostly from New York City. Uh, men would come out to synagogues on Long Island if you had enough money to pay them. In a lot of cases, I think synagogues existed without a rabbi. Um, there were people who could leave services. Um, you know, there were certain examples of uh, places on Long Island that had a shochet, which is a, a ritual slaughterer of animals, so they could have kosher meat. Um, otherwise, you'd have to go into New York City to get kosher meat. And people at these congregations in the early period, um, you know, they kept kosher, they observed the holidays, and, uh, but I will say many of them were open on Saturdays. And that was really just because they had to earn a living. Um, so that was, yes? So it's a really interesting question. Yeah. Did I come across incidents of anti-Semitism yeah. on Long Island? So the research that I've done has been determined based on what I could find that was reported at the time. And if somebody's store was burned or if somebody was beaten up, in this period it was not reported as anti-Semitism. It was just a crime. 
And so it was very difficult to find examples of anti-Semitism. However, we do know a few things. There certainly was anti-Semitism then, as there is now. And certainly it's as bad now as anybody can imagine. But in the early days, there are examples of uh, Jews who were not allowed to join country clubs, yacht clubs, bowling leagues, social clubs, etc. And so to counteract that, you had a man in Freeport whose name was Hugo Stearns, and he built a nine-hole golf course in Freeport. You had uh, Otto Kahn who built Ohika Castle because he was prevented from joining a golf club in New Jersey, and so he built his own 18-hole golf course along with Ohika Castle, which is the second largest private home ever built in the United States. Um, there was one example that I did get firsthand from a, an elderly man, he was 92, and he lived in Great Neck. He told me that his grandfather moved to Hicksville in the 1890s, and he left Hicksville specifically because of anti-Semitism. And he moved to Glen Cove because at the time that was the only place on Long Island that had a congregation. So that's pretty much the, the, the example that I have of anti-Semitism. Um, <coughs> yes, so there were a number of communities on Long Island as you get more into the 1930s and 40s that perhaps had unwritten rules against admitting Jews, against having blacks purchase homes in their communities. And, um, you know, Levittown, Abe Levitt, was a builder, and he himself uh, preferred not to sell to Jews. And he was Jewish himself. Um, so, yeah, there are examples of, of this kind of thing that, that have happened, and uh, it's, it's not a bright chapter, but we persevered. And in Garden City, there is a synagogue, and in Manhasset, there are synagogues. And I'll tell you a quick story about a synagogue in Port Washington, the community synagogue in Port Washington. You belong there. So you might know that when it was founded in 1952, they purchased the estate of the Fleischmann Yeast family. And when they bought the estate to use as their synagogue, they met resistance from the Sands Point Village Board who prevented them from operating a synagogue there. They made up whatever they wanted to say because they didn't want a synagogue in their community. Well, it went to the New York State Supreme Court and the New York State Supreme Court ruled in favor of the congregation and they were allowed to open in Sands Point. And the same thing happened two weeks later in Garden City because the precedent had been set. 1952. It was on the front page of the New York Times. Yes? Yes. That's our great-grandfather. Amazing. All of us here. But I presume you're going to have another volume. Right? But well, <laughs> so, here, so here's what I'll say about Abram Wolf and, his, and how he factors into the book. He came to Long Island before 1918, so he is absolutely in the book. And there's a chapter about uh, the Gold Coast, and I wrote about him and under Great Neck. So there, there is... I was going to say, because my mother, Rita Wolf, was born in 1916 in Great Neck. Okay. And then her name should be in the book. And there were other Jewish families. Yes. And you said that Bethel was founded in 32, but they must have been active as a Jewish community before then, because I know my mother was confirmed in Bethel, and I don't know that she was <coughs> right. So just to clarify, Temple Bethel was built in 1932, right. the synagogue itself, but the congregation existed, I believe, starting in 1927. And it was held in a church. It was church before it was built. Yes. All, all three Reformed congregations in Great Neck started in the community, community what was then church. a community church. Right. Community. And, yeah. and do you know how many synagogues are in Great Neck today? Oh, I'd like to know. 42. 42. 22. Oh my God. 22 synagogues. 
just in Great Neck. In the five towns, you have 50. Yes. Well, you know, it, it, every, every little steeple counts in my, in my book. I have a question for my yes. family, if no one else. Okay. Kenilworth, the country club. What, I mean, I, my mother used to tell me that our grandfather would take her to the Kenilworth for the club. To the Kenilworth club. is a country club? No. Yeah, the swim club there. Oh, no. What was it? What was it? Yeah. So Kenilworth still exists in Kings Point, and, yeah, and a, did your family belong to it? Is that no. what you're saying? Right. 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 The comment is that IG Wolf was a real estate company and IG Wolf is responsible for securing the land where Bethel was built and Temple Israel right. as well. Yeah. And, so they knew, and, and he was involved developing Kenilworth, which is why they were able to go to the swim, swim club there. That's why I thought she it was, was restricted. All right. Oh, huh. Okay, I'm looking here and I do see a number of wolves. So we'll take a look. We'll take a look afterwards. And hopefully I did, I did a good job in uh, <laughs> recording the accurate history of your family. It would have been based on census records that were taken in 1910 and 1920. Question. <laughs> what about the colognes of Long Island? What about them? I, listen, I'm a recent compared to everything else that I've covered. I mean, I wasn't raised on Long Island. I came here because my wife is from Long Island. Oh. What every nice Jewish boy does, right? He goes to live where his wife is from. How did you get so interested in this subject? How did I get interested in this subject? Well, I can tell you that in 2015, the synagogue that I belong to, uh, Midway Jewish Center in Syosset, was doing a renovation of the sanctuary. And I went in, I've always been interested in history, um, and I went in the night before demolition of the sanctuary and was taking photographs when I started to think of what a transformation to a space means to a community. And when the change is made, who is going to remember what was there before? Then I thought of it on like a larger context. Well, here on Long Island, so many synagogues have closed. Who is going to remember them? And I went home that night and I just realized and found not a lot of information available online. So that's when I took it upon myself to, I, I was so shocked that, that nobody had, had done this research before. And I will also say, Long Island today has over 300,000 Jews, making it the fourth largest Jewish community in the United States. New York City is number one, Los Angeles is number two, Southern Florida is number three. Maybe some of you have dual citizenship, I'm not sure. <laughs> Go back and forth. But in any case, um, Long Island being the fourth largest Jewish community today, nobody's really talked about the history that exists. And it's just been completely overlooked for whatever reason. But writing these books and establishing the Jewish Historical Society of Long Island, I think has brought greater awareness. And, uh, you know, if you were interested in purchasing a book and learning more, this is just a 45-minute presentation. There's 300 pages here in this book. Is the book on Audible? The book, is it on Audible? That's a really good question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I think it's available on Kindle. Okay. Uh, I don't know if it's available on Audible, but I'm pretty sure it's available on Kindle. Yes? My day job, yes, this is absolutely a, uh, a, a passion project, a side hustle, if you will. Um, but uh, I work for the New York Times. Uh, I am on the business side. Uh, I work in advertising. For how long? Uh, I've been at the New York Times for 27 years. Does the name Jill Holzman mean anything to you? Jill Holzman was a boss of mine. My good friend. Oh. Oh. So many connections here. That's the Jewish world, isn't it? I mean, yes. Um, do you cover Henry Bandel in your book? Because he built a really glorious mansion. Do you know what year the mansion was built? 
Really? Okay. Well, I hope he's in the book. Otherwise, I might have to do another edition. Bendel. Bendel. And he was Jewish. Okay. We'll have to take... Really? Interesting. Yes. Yes, I absolutely can. Can I tell about Jewish cemeteries on Long Island? So in the early days when congregations were forming, the organizations were all faced with the same question. Should we build a synagogue or should we purchase land for a cemetery? And this caused great debate and there were synagogues that actually broke up because they couldn't come to a consensus on this. In most cases, they went with the cemetery. And why did they do that? Because it was cheaper. They could purchase land and then utilize it to bury the dead when they needed. But to build a synagogue, you had to not only purchase the land, but you had to build the building. And, you know, to, to us, I think today, you would, you would look back on that as, as sort of like a, you know, not, not, not even a difficult decision, because would you want, in a, in a community that's first forming, would you want to dedicate your money to something in the past? or to something in the future. And certainly building a synagogue is more representative of the future. But the reality is that not everybody had the means, um, but that was what congregations did. So you have synagogues, uh, you have cemeteries on Long Island, very old cemeteries, going back as far as 1876 in Lindenhurst. You have 1890 in East Hampton, and then you have others in the earliest days, there's one in Bayshore, there's one in Patchogue, there's one in Setauket. Wherever these congregations were in the early days, that's where you'll find about a half a dozen Jewish cemeteries on Long Island. And they were also very valuable in my research because I would go and look at the headstones and see if somebody was born before 1918. That's somebody else I should be doing research on. Maybe one more question? So this synagogue was in Babylon. This synagogue was actually in Lindenhurst, which is in the town of Babylon. And the one on your other book is where? The book that I first wrote, Seeking Sanctuary, this synagogue is in uh, Lindbrook. In Lindbrook. And to me, this is one of the, well, it is the, my favorite synagogue from the exterior. You can't really see it. I can go back to the beginning. But it is the only synagogue that was built in the Moorish Revival architecture style. Um, it, it's just very unique. It's no longer a synagogue. It's actually a Baptist church. But the church has maintained the Jewish symbolism on the outside, whether it's a Star of David or some Hebrew writing that exists. They have kept it the way it was. Well, I don't know if I want to pass it back to Carol or uh, just basically thank everybody for coming tonight. And if you're interested in purchasing a book, come on over. Thank you very much.